Hey, we're glad to have you here today. For those of you who are new, One Million Cups is really, it's designed to sell entrepreneurs, um, it's designed to educate the community on entrepreneurship across the country over a cup of coffee. So uh, these events happen all over our commu different communities and different cities. They're bought, brought, uh, they're sponsored by a cup of coffee, a coffee sponsor, a cup sponsor, usually with a local coffee grocery featured. So uh, this month I'll step into my sponsor role. As, <laughs> as Accelerated Wealth, uh, we're sponsoring One Million Cups because we believe in the Colorado Springs community. We believe in entrepreneurship. And our mission and our goal at Accelerated Wealth is to unlock dollars for business owners that they didn't think was accessible. A lot of times you hear in the news about the big corporations, you know, the Fortune 100, the Fortune 500 companies, and what their strategies they're using and why they have a different competitive edge over the small business owner in, in Main Street. And so what we do is we take those business strategies and unlock those dollars for small business owners here in our community. We're headquartered here, this is our home. We have 16 offices in six states. And uh, we're growing every day as a company and love to support small businesses and events like One Million Cups. Our cup sponsor is the Small Business Development Center of Southern Colorado. That's a great resource for those of you who are interested in entrepreneurship and business. They do a lot of free classes on marketing and taxes and all kinds of different things you can utilize as a business owner, as a resource to become a stronger business owner and a stronger business so that you can help our community grow and thrive. So uh, with that, uh, we're going to turn it over to our first speaker with Ed with Culture of Michigan. Welcome, Ed. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So Good let's, morning. Let's warm you up. Oh, I'm going to have to look at the screen. Okay. Let's warm you up with a question. Uh, who here has ever ended up in the wrong group? Maybe you can do the job really well, but you shouldn't do it in that company. You can play really well. You shouldn't be on that particular team. Congregation, student body. Who here knows that feeling besides me? So keep that in mind because that's where we're going with this one. Our uh, business journey, since that's what we're all about here, starts with my partner and I running a technology analysis company for a few years, doing hard engineering stuff, uh, aviation, unmanned systems, those sorts of things. And we noticed a source of sought, which is a government entity looking for a service. This one was really odd, because the source of sought said, somebody needs to come in and measure our culture and help us fix it. That gave us an aha moment that if we could get people to stop lying, we could do this job. And blah, blah, blah. But what really happened with these people, we're pretty convinced, is that they had a huge failure caused by an internal culture clash. So we took that aha moment and we created a tool that basically got people to be honest in a group. And I can explain a little later how that works. These folks, this particular organization dodged the bullet because sequestration happened and they didn't actually have to be measured which I can tell you just terrifies bureaucrats. But we, in the meantime, continue to develop the tool. So the idea is that if you can get people to feel so comfortable on one side of the equation and so motivated on the other side of the equation to actually be honest in a group, you can collect hard data, not a survey, no interpretation, but hard data on the group, which we then had the skills to uh, analyze and display. So that's how we got from a technology analysis company to something that is now being created to measure cultures. Initially, this is designed for employment, and specifically veteran employment. This is about three years ago or so. The idea was that if you could measure businesses and measure veterans individually, which is far easier to do, you could match them for employment, where the employer pulls people into interviews where everybody already knows how well they're going to fit. So imagine being invited to interview by a company where you both know that you're going to fit, regardless of what the job happens to be. We have then uh, transformed that into a foundation inside the Public Benefit Corporation, but it's still there. If we were doing this for employment, which is absolutely critical, we will insist on these sorts of levels of confidence. Normal statistics, really hard to get this level. You can see that the smaller the group, the more people, the higher percentage of the group you must measure. If you're doing this job for something other than employment, then the confidence level is negotiable. 
So we then, through our manual beta testing, which we finished, developed this way to display the results. While this is actually a hard number scale to us, to the leadership we display it to, it's one extreme generally bad, to the other extreme generally considered good, the mean, the white dot in the middle, the standard deviation wrapped around it, and it's very intuitive. If the measure has an outlier, which is a subset that actually falls outside its own standard deviation, we highlight that just for, just for knowledge. It doesn't change the numbers, but the leaders really like to know where they have an outlier, and I'll show you one here in a second. So this is a real result from a real group here in town. I can tell you it's from a nonprofit. And in this case, the leadership actually liked it because the, the group displays quite a bit of initiative, and they even had an outlier that said they really know they've got to get the job done. The leaders generally like this one when I can tell you for sure they generally didn't like some of the other ones. We call it technically yuck. <laughs> so if we were to compare two groups or an individual into a group, we would use the same display method. And you can see instantly how well one group does or does not overlap with another group on this particular topic. And then, of course, you can display all of this with however many topics you measured, generally 25 or 27. And we only limit it to that many out of the 56 we've got because that fits easily into an hour. Group walks in, hour later they walk out. Simple. So what are we doing now? We are at the point of creating the minimum viable product to start selling this. And the minimum viable product has to do with measuring groups only for their own information. So no individual matching yet because that's much harder. Say a group wants to improve its culture, like the sources saw it, we saw at the top. Or say two groups need to be compared for something like a merger and acquisition. We can do that today. And that's it. What questions do you have? <laughs> Sir. How did you get, first get started in the field of cultural measurements? What inspired you to go that direction? So the question is what inspired us to go into this cultural thing. It really was that source of thought because, to be honest, I was fired by that organization about eight years ago. And that should tell you that I understand their culture perfectly. A little bit better than they do, maybe. So when the source of thought came by for something we already knew so well, that literally did turn on the light bulb that said, if we can get people to stop lying so that we can trust the data, then this comparison, or in their case, measure where you are, and then measure their progress getting to where they, want, they thought they wanted to be, is really not hard. It was the honesty part that was the only hard piece. So that bit about, have we all been there? That really is it. Please. Yeah. It sounds great. It's intentionally provocative. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and is there, are there certain, are there certain questions or data points or certain keys that help uh, people? You, you, you touched on getting people yeah. to a comfort level. Right. I think there's like a comfortable environment where you, you know you're, it's a safe, is it that environment that helps pull out that? Or so or is the question, know? what do I mean by lying or how do we get people to quit? <laughs> to quit lying, you know? Yeah. Okay. So, what, and I, like I said, I say lying to be intentionally provocative. People lie generally out of fear. In, in, in this survey cultural analysis setting where there's nothing personally to be gained generally, you're like in a, a group. So, for example, uh, well, I, I have a lot to do with the cadets at the academy, and they get surveyed endlessly. So the staff up there says, look, it's Survey Monkey, you're anonymous. And the kids will say, well, you, you're training us to be the best hackers on the planet. You know what key I'm thinking about touching. You know? So they don't believe that in any small way. So in that environment, people then spin their answers. They say what they think the boss wants to hear, or what the lawyer told them to say, or maybe what they read off the glossy brochure or the website. So, are a lot of people honest? For sure. But are there enough who are afraid or maybe even intentionally sabotaging the survey to nullify the results? Often enough. Often enough that there's a whole industry out there of people who say, we can come in, survey, and we don't use that word, survey your culture, tell you what it's like, and fix it. I'm not convinced that's possible. Right. So then, on the other half of your question, how do we get people to quit? 
there, it's always a carrot and stick. So if we were measuring a coherent group in here, for example, we would, well, first of all, we would have made sure it's a coherent group. You can't mix two cultures together, you get mush at the end in the, in the numbers. It's a two part, let's say this is for employment. One obvious side is that if you give us the glossy brochure, or what you think the boss wants to hear, or anything that is not perfectly honest, then your next manager will be the lie. Your, your organization is gonna hire your next boss based on your lie. So that if you're not timely at all, but you say you are, the next boss will be standing at the door waiting for you when you're late. Don't do that. You can find a boss who doesn't mind whatever it is you really are, so be honest, and the boss will fit. The other part is that we make people so perfectly anonymous, and there's some proprietary stuff going on here, that I can tell you from experience, maybe a third of the way into that hour measure, you can feel the tension draining out of the room. It's like people, they're so anonymous, they don't even know where their own responses are. So it's, it's almost like, oh yeah, I'm all over this, because they can be honest and perfectly safe for once. Okay, did that help? Yes. Okay. Please. So what happens when you have, in my experience inside organizations, it takes one stakeholder to throw on the culture of the organization. What happens when you have one outlier who's actually degrading the culture of an entire group of individuals? What do you do with that data, and how does that, how does that manifest itself? Okay, and the question has to do with how, essentially a leader, I believe you mean, right? I, I do mean. Sets, basically role. sets the culture, enforces the culture, maybe is the reason that these surveys don't work. First of all, we don't measure leaders. When we measure the culture of a group, it's never, ever management. They're not allowed in the room, preferably not in the building. So they're never there. And part of that anonymity is that the managers never see the, the measure itself, and the group never sees the topics and things that management sees. If the two sides were ever to talk to each other, it wouldn't make any sense. You know, because the manager might say, what do you think about topic green? And the group would say, nobody asked me about green stuff. Okay, so that's part of our tool. But your point about management often being the problem is more accurate or more relevant than you may even understand. We've been turned down in our beta testing by every level of government, everyone, including one organization that is so dysfunctional that a few years ago, a customer went to the boss's home and murdered him. So the new boss told his staff, okay, make sure this never happens again. So thought that was an opportunity, went and offered this free beta test, we measure it, we give them the results, we walk away. Two months later, the, the staffer we were working with admitted that she couldn't get any of the mid-level managers to cooperate no matter what the boss said. They completely defied him because they weren't going to have the measure of themselves that you're implying there. So yeah, now the organization the, the primary one that did let us do the beta testing had, let's call it, an enlightened boss way at the top who just made him do it. And that's often what it takes, especially with a broken organization. That earlier source of thought that I put on the screen, in fact, um, well, I've got the whole thing later on if you want to read all the, the verbiage. I am convinced that somebody with more horsepower than they have, which is like one person in the Air Force, uh, told him to shut up in color, just forced them to do it because they weren't going to do it on their own. Anybody else? Yeah. When you talk about uh, to sell the tool, is what you sell, is, is, it, is it sort of done for them and they just do everything or do you have to walk with them to customize it? Okay. I, I believe the question sort of is, how does this work? Do we give the tool to the organization or do we run it ourselves? Is that about right? This is so highly proprietary, it will never ever leave our touch. To include our own people who go deliver the measure. So the process generally works that we would sell the service, so we're selling the service, to an organization, and again, very likely has to be the, the one person on the top. That's kind of how this goes. We then negotiate with the organization on which of our measures they want, which of those topics, integrity, communications, timeliness, honesty, all kinds of stuff, to include assaults if they really want to get into that kind of stuff. We then uh, create the specific measure for that organization based on the topics that the leadership chose, go back into the group just like this, deliver the measure just like this where there are no electrons involved in their responses at all, process it, and then bring it back to the leadership. 
Now what they do with it can go down several different paths, but they never touch the measure, and in fact, even our own people never touch the whole thing. Uh, that, by the way, let me anticipate the next question, which is, how do you assure the businesses that this spectacular business intelligence won't get out, won't get leaked? Can you imagine measuring a military organization or a corporation, especially one in crisis, and then you, you know more about them than they do at that point, you really do. So that scares people. Mm -hmm. So the other part of your response is part of the reason that even our own people don't have the results is they can't leak it then. The other, this thing is so perfectly anonymous uh, that we w we're going to extreme lengths. If anyone's been at, had vault level security clearances in the military, then you know that there are air gaps and physical security things. Nothing ever, ever touches the internet. We do all that stuff. Okay. And the, the assurance to the leaders are, the first time any of this leaks, we're out of business forever. It's trust. The very first and only moment that we leak anything, no matter how, our fault, nobody's fault, doesn't matter, we're out of business forever. Does that help? Please. Can you talk about the process between beta and where you're now in the tweets and the lessons that you learned mm -hmm. to take it from beta to a, to a viable solution that you have now in that process and how you guys went about that? The, well, we're, we're actually at the minimum viable product, which is still manual. So I, the question is, how do we get from beta to what we can deliver today? And I'm going to imply then, uh, how do we then automate the whole thing and bring it to what we really want it to be? Yeah, lessons learned. Okay. Ah, well the lessons learned. <laughs> so in beta testing, we went into groups like this, although we, we couldn't control the numbers. So the confidence was not what we dictated, it's just the way it worked. And it was 50 to 60% generally. So one of the huge lessons learned was that in all cases where I went to the out brief, let's call it, and it wasn't all of them, but in all cases where I was there, I was in the back, I wasn't doing the presenting, but everybody knew what I was, and I had to stop the show 20 or 30 percent into it, in all cases. And it's because I could hear the leadership getting so interested in, in their results that they were talking about making changes, and I'd have to say, whoa, time out, please. We have 50 or 60 percent confidence, whatever it really was, so while this thing, this topic that's on the screen, where, again, we technically call it yich, where you don't like the result for I don't care why, that you can certainly use our results to look into that deeper, but please don't make changes based on 60%. So the, the lesson learned there was that these leaders were really hungry for this stuff because they had cultural understanding that they could finally trust. There were some other minor things. For example, we didn't used to care which extreme was on which side of the scale, and they would always, always talk about, okay, we want to be on the left side for this one, right side for this one. So we just normalized it so that all the so-called good was on one side, the so-called bad was on the other side. Judgment call. Uh, other than that, though, the tool and the displays worked pretty well. That bit about Yilach was kind of a surprise. We also, and I'll go one step further, which is, uh, what do you do with this employment profile? Do you hire into what the organization really no kidding has? The answer is, I don't think so. Because in those cases, I don't think the leaders really ever wanted what they really had, ever. Now remember, we're doing 25 or 27 topics. So there were two or four of those where we were certain they would say, don't give me more of that, give me something adjusted, which to us is just numbers. So I'm pretty convinced that we will hire into a desired profile far more often than into the real profile. And then there'll be some big strings attached to that. Anybody else? Okay, so I did you, we get the assessment, you come in, so what? What do I do after that? Do you, do yeah. you take them through the process of improving culture, hiring, mean, what's the, or are you the assessment piece and then hand it to okay. us as product? So the question is, what does the leadership do with this service we deliver? The answer is it depends on what they bought. So if they're doing mergers and acquisitions, then we would display, all right, your groups are going to fit just like that. You know, you are Fiat, you are Chrysler. And then whether well, they continue with the merger is that completely up to them. If, they're, if they've hired us for just cultural understanding like that source is sought, then we actually do have a little stable of PhDs who say they can do this stuff and they write books and they say they can do cultural change. Again, I'm not convinced that's possible, at least not with, with the exact same people you have. 
So we would be essentially the subcontractor to measure their incremental improvement over time, but it would be between them and the PhD who sells that service as to how they want to go down that path. Now, if they're doing employment, which we consider our core function, especially for veterans, then the group, let's say that they are plumbers. Uh, yeah, XYZ Plumbing comes to us and says, hey, we want to hire uh, two more plumbers, give me 10 to interview. We would take their profile, go into our database, which is the hard part, that's where the automation has to come in, screen it for plumbers who will work wherever ABC wants them to work, and then run the tool that ABC got against the entire profile all those individual plumbers got as if they were sitting in the same room at the same time. Then we can say, okay, here's your list of 10. They match 92% to 78%. We just told them that you're looking at their profile. They won't think you're spam. And then the interview process is whatever it is. That makes sense? Cost, though, I said. Well, how are you running the cost of the implementation set? I'm sure it depends you know, on what you're providing. That's interesting um, because we've... We are going to start with some extremely high profile groups that everybody knows that I can't go into. And in order to be credible with them, you have to add a couple zeros to your fee. If you're cheap, you're not worth it. So if it was this group, say XYZ Plumbing, it would cost a couple thousand dollars. You know, you just want your culture measured a couple thousand dollars, you're done. If it's for uh, veterans in the database, we've set their price at 50 bucks for life. So we measure them. They can remeasure themselves on occasion, but again, it's, it's just electrons, so 50 bucks for life for however long they want to stay in there and keep their profile updated. So the answer really depends greatly on the demand. Anyone else? Please. What's your target market? I mean, are you looking for the, the smaller plumbing companies, or are you looking for big, talented people organizations? The answer depends on whether we're doing this minimum viable product where we need to maximize the payoff for our time, in which case we are targeting the, the big national organizations I just mentioned. When this gets rolling, which will follow a license model, so it has to be delivered in person. So there'll be licensees all over the nation, you know, like, uh, like a burger franchise. And they will do their own selling into their own markets. The, the central group will keep firm control on all the data the licensees won't even have the own, their data they generate, so they can't leak it because they won't have it, for example. But that's way down the road in the best case answer. So we have time for one more question before our super special question. <laughs> Anybody have another question? No, nothing from you guys in the back? Really? I told you I start in the back. Please. The assessments that uh, you are making. I think the question is, how small a group can we measure? The answer is about 50-ish, and it depends a lot on how they're structured. If it's a mom and pop deli where you're, met, you're asking the cousins about grandma, that's not going to work. If it's a 50-ish uh, size group that is fairly cohesive, XYZ plumbing, 45 plumbers and an office staff, then you saw earlier, you're probably going to have to measure 42 of the 45 plumbers just to get 90% you know, confidence. As you get to a much bigger organization, like over 1,000, then you're only measuring 250-ish, again, to get to 90%. If you only want a measure for, say, a merger and acquisition, 80% is good for you, you may only have to do 6 or 7% of a 10,000-person group. Again, it's just normal stats, so the answer depends. So who's that handle? Well, there is 50-ish, and again, it depends on how it's organized. If it's a family business, probably not. I did. The, the very short-term immediate need is that I have to create a stable of trained individuals on contract basis, side gig basis, so that when we sell this service to an organization somewhere around here or anywhere in the country, because you know, if they want to fly us out, that's fine, we have to be able to take yes for an answer. So I need half a dozen or so people who are trained on the tool, who've been through it themselves, and can go into that 
organization, figure out where the tribes are, because again, you have to measure coherent groups. Um, sociologists, cultural anthropologists, uh, military spouses are really good at this because they've been dropped into groups over and over and over again. You know, their kids are actually better, if you want to be honest. So we need to build about a half a dozen folks who can take that yes for an answer. And then as we go through, we very soon need to automate the entire process just because outrageous success in our book is like 5,000 organizations on one side of the database and say 100,000 individuals on the other side. And while it's easy numbers, there's a boatload of them, so that has to be automated too. Okay. Thank you. Oh, we're supposed to go over here. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, now it's time for our community announcements. This is not a time to advertise your business, but a time that there's a chamber event or a fundraiser for some organization or anything you know uh, going on in the community, like pitch night for Peak Startup or anything like that. So you know, uh, we'd love to hear those announcements at this time. Anybody have any announcements? I do. Yeah, I'm on the uh, committee for the Banning Lewis Branch Academy. Uh, they're having a Santa Spring 5K December 9th. Uh, the benefit of the school, <laughs> as well as, sorry. As well as the foundation. Uh, it's, it's Saturday, December 9th, in Banning Lewis Branch. The course is fast, the easy uh, 5K course takes on the tour of Banning Lewis. And then the post race party has a lot of free activities for kids that come to the course. Uh, Coach Will Santa and Mrs. Claus will be there to stretch in the morning for kids. So, great, uh, great fundraiser event, and we'd love to see you out. Um, I just think to make an announcement. We have a wonderful um, fine arts center here in town. A lot of people are not very familiar with it. But it does offer three different free community open times. This Friday night, which is Fine Art Friday, um, the museum is open from 5 until 7. It has truly exceptional exhibits, and, and we are world famous in many ways um, because of our collections. Um, then the first Saturday, I'm sorry, the second Saturday and the third Friday um, are also free days, so they waive the total admission. You can stay hours and hours. You can talk to citizens all day long. I think you find it a lot of fun, and it's one of those community things you want to share with somebody else after you've been there. Um, senior Resource Council, if you want to reach 535 seniors and about 60 to 100 uh, different organizations, that's $100 to buy a table. Senior Resource Council, SRCCOS.com. And it's coming up December 9th, so they'll need to know. Does anybody else have any questions?
why this type of organization might work well in our community here. Um, we, there, there are other cryotherapy places around town, but uh, we're, we're going to take a little different approach. Uh, first of all, I want to give you a little background of why my family got involved with this. And I'm going to kind of turn it over to Donna, and she'll kind of explain to you why we decided to open up this business here in Colorado Springs. Hi, I'm actually from Cortez, Colorado. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you know what Cortez is. It's about this big in <laughs> southwest Colorado. Um, my chiropractor, I was going to my chiropractor for aches and pains, and he got a cryotherapy machine. It's a sauna. And the sauna is, I don't know if any of you have seen a cryotherapy machine, it's this big round tubular thing where your head's sticking out and the nitrogen is kind of blowing out. Um, and that's what he had. And so he introduced this to me. My sister, so we've got a family of five kids. Um, I'm the youngest, my sister's the oldest, and then there's three boys in between. Chris is the oldest of the, of the sons. So my sister Deb came and her wife came to visit, and um, she has fibromyalgia. So when I was talking to my chiro chiropractor um, about whether or not, you know, how is this for somebody that has fibromyalgia? Because I wanted her to try it out. He um, sent a bunch of studies to me. So I was looking it over. Bought her a two for one package. When she was at my um, visiting, she went the first day. She felt really good afterwards. Um, the second day, she went two days in a row. The second day was the first time she felt pain free in over a year. Now she is on, or was on, lots of medications on a daily basis, six to eight thousand. She's just started taking medical marijuana just to get to sleep at night. And um, by the time she was done visiting in two weeks, she was off of medical marijuana. And now she, and she goes regularly about um, once or twice a week um, until we actually open our business. Um, and She's down two or three out of ten a month, if kind of something flares up. Her reaction just excited us, and we're like, wow, this is great. She can come back to Colorado Springs, follow up with the cryotherapy, and this is awesome. And so I talked to Jeremy, the chiropractor, and I'm like, what do you think about that? And he said, I don't know if there are any in Colorado Springs. You need to look into that. Well, we did, and there's only one place at that time that had um, cryotherapy. Now, Cortez has about eight to 9,000 people, and um, it's mostly farmers and ranchers. And Jeremy was able to pay off his machine in two months. And so I'm thinking, okay, we're going to a community that has three quarters of a million people, and there's only one cryotherapy place, and we know we have lots of athletes. We have lots of people. Actually, this area is one of the highest um, concentration of people with autoimmune diseases. Um, and we just saw that this community needs something like this. So we decided to open our business and, and start doing the research and, um, and decided to take kind of things on a different um, slant and, and kind of be more forward thinking than I think the other cryotherapy places throughout Colorado are. So, let me give you a little background of what cryotherapy is. It was a technology that was developed by a Japanese doctor in 1978, Yamaguchi. He specialized in rheumatoid arthritis. He was trying to find a way to reduce and eliminate his client's inflammation and pain. And over the decades, he'd been giving them pharmaceuticals that he probably wasn't doing their livers and kidneys any good. And so he came up with this technology. So the technology of cryotherapy has been in Japan and Europe for three decades now. They've done a lot of studies. So here's the biology behind it. You get into uh, a cryotherapy machine, and you get real cold. I'm not going to lie to you. It's kind of fun, but you get real cold real fast. And it tricks your brain into thinking that you're going into hypothermia. So the first thing the brain says is, well, this isn't normal. We're going to have to kick it into survival mode. So what it does, it constricts your 
capillaries in your arms and legs, recirculates the blood in your core organs, because this is what's going to keep us alive. And it kicks up oxygen levels, uh, enzymes, nutrients that are present in our blood all the time, but not at these levels. And you're only in that, the, the chamber for two to three minutes, and as soon as you step out, all of these goodies that your body just created itself, without any uh, other drugs being ingested, go to the rest of your body. Okay, so that's the biology behind it. One of the things that we've noticed over the last few decades of what it does and all the studies that they've done, um, you know, kick up your metabolism. Uh, things like endorphins get jacked up right away because your body's going into a survival mode. And um, here's, here's the thing. We, uh, we opened our, our, our doors about three months ago. We're out of our six minutes. Okay. So, um, go ahead. We'll start back here. Yeah. You want to go uh, So, I just want to say real quick that I ran into someone who does this a little while ago at a convention. I was bored of walking around with the boots. Okay. And I was having knee problems. And she actually did like spot treatments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I jumped up on her table completely, basically looking, this was a great excuse to not talk to anyone for about five minutes. <laughs> um, and my knee, which has been giving me pain for the last several weeks, felt better like five minutes later and felt better for about the next four days. So I, I'm a believer in the technology. Okay. So my question is, A, do you do spot treatments like that? B, the picture on your slide is not the like tube, no. which I think you were planning on addressing, so I'll just kind of give you a good well, time to do that. We do have a spot treatment machine, and as for localized uh, elbows, knees, shoulders, if you are experiencing aches and pains, our technology is a little different. We went and spent the latest uh, or the most advanced technology out there. We don't have a, a tube. We don't have a song. We have a true chamber. And the difference is the tube is, is where they literally pump nitrogen in and circulate it around your body and get you real cold. The chamber, we don't expose our clients to the nitrogen. There are some inherent risks risk in that, mostly lack of oxygen in, in the tube. But what we do is we circulate our nitrogen through copper coils in the back of the chamber and then push air past those coils. And so we only expose our clients to super cool air. The nitrogen is like 78% of air that we breathe. So it's not, I mean, there's a lot of nitrogen that we're breathing. It's not a whole lot of oxygen. most effective if our clients come in very well hydrated, okay? Because of the metabolism that kicks up, and here's the thing, not in the three minutes that you're in the chamber, but over the course of the next 20 to 30 minutes as you're acclimate back to regular temperature, your body's gonna burn anywhere from five to 800 calories throughout the process. Go ahead. So that doesn't look like a very inexpensive machine. Can you talk about the process of you guys decided to go with investors, loans, the inside and outs of those discussions, and what you learned about starting your business and funding your business. Okay, I can take that one. So, um, my sister, um, her wife, and I are the owners of, of, of this company. All of us have law enforcement backgrounds. None of us, we all had like home businesses and things. And as a matter of fact, I have a home business. and. And of course, that is why I bore dogs. Something totally different than what we've got going on here. So this was a huge learning curve for us to open a um, storefront and a business. And so we initially thought, oh, we need to get investors, and we need to do this, and we need to do that. And it was a great, it was a lot of fun, actually. I had a lot of fun learning the whole process of starting a business. We were fortunate in that, um, our mother um, had two rental properties that um, she decided to put on the market. And last spring, when the market was just booming, and so she um, gave us the opportunity to borrow the money to get things started up. So that was much easier than trying to get a small business loan, obviously. So, yeah. Um, how long have you been working? Okay, so um, I started cryotherapy for the very first time at the end of August, August last year. When Deb and Becky came to visit me, it was last October. Um, by the end of October, by the end of their visit, we decided
decided to start a business. So it took us basically from November um, uh, until September 29th when we actually got the doors open. The, the, the longest um, delay in our opening was the, just the build out and dealing with the construction and things like that. So are you running this, but is it, are you training people? I mean, what's the train if I come to you and you put me in this thing? How do I know that you know that what to do, right? You know, see where I'm at? Is, are you able to just bring people in as employees? Is there training behind the science of this, of making sure I get good results? That's a great question. Um, the, the technology that we purchased, this chamber, came from Poland. And when we purchased it, part of the purchase price was they would bring uh, their technicians out and train all of the employees that we had at that time so that they knew all the proper procedures and things to do, things not to do when we brought clients in and exposed them to the technology. The other, the other piece is um, just getting out there and going online and learning all you can about cryotherapy and um, what different things it is helping. They're finding all sorts of, um, you know, is targeted for um, people with rheumatoid arthritis and, and, and MS, obviously, most people know it from uh, professional athletes and celebrities doing it. So, you know, the athletes have found that it helps their recovery time um, and helps them heal faster. Um, and you know, then there's all these things that are just kind of happy accidents as far as the benefits, um, the, the calorie burns with the spot treatments and the facials is helping people with acne. Um, and plus it just feels amazing just to sit there for 12 minutes and have somebody Low cold air on their face and, and scalp. Um, hangovers. I mean, it's just all these great things. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, it helps that. It helps that. It helps that. It's like, why wouldn't we want to bring this to our community? Go ahead. Uh, what is the cost for a treatment, or how does that work in terms of pricing? Do you buy a package of treatments, and how are you growing your business? Um, who is your audience right now? That, that's a great question. If you just come in off the street without any reservations or anything, the cost is $59. Okay, we are offering packages. In fact, we are having an official grand opening Saturday, December 2nd, so this Saturday. We're gonna run three sessions from noon to five so that people that aren't familiar with it can get exposed to the technology and see if it might benefit them. Um, and we are offering, at that same time period from noon to five, uh, half price on our packages. But we do have five packs, 10 packs, uh, some people will purchase a monthly unlimited, so. We also have the introductory price of, of two for 50. Um, we have times, um, we have a lunch hour special or a happy hour special, so we, we really try to make it so that nobody actually has to pay the full price. And who's your audience right now? How are they finding you? Right now, most of our people are, are athletes, um, but we do have new massage therapists who have been, um, have people that have issues. We have somebody come in with Crohn's disease, um, lymphatic um, issues, and so we our demographics cover 12 to 100 girls, um, whether it's uh, athletes or somebody with just aches and pains, just somebody that wants to feel better. So yes. Okay, you're in your first month, so my sympathies. <laughs>
training every quarter um, different than graphics. And um, just running specials for those um, different Don't things. Don't do group five. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely 100% serious. Um, and you know, one of the things that we really want to do is give back to the community. So as we are, are, are planning out our, our marketing strategy, we're going to be focusing on um, things that, uh, fundraising, things, awareness months and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, breast cancer awareness, that particular quarter we'll be you know, focusing on that and just kind of having our, our theme for that demographic concentrated on that because we want to also, you know, provide, um, get to the point where we are able to give back to the community based on those fundraising months and stuff.
So it's all ready to pretty much double our size. Um, and, you know, long term, five year, we're thinking about other locations and possibly even franchise opportunities. Yes, sir. So what medical rules do you have to follow or interactions do you have with the medical community? Um, well, in Europe, this is uh, their FDA equivalent has approved it as a medical treatment. The United States is so far behind like they fall on all of that. So right now, it's not FDA approved. Um, we're anticipating that it will be sometime in the future. Um, we are reaching out to doctors just to let them know um, that this technology is available. Um, my sister had uh, full knee surgery, so she went, she did um, whole body and spot treatments um, every day for five days before her surgery. Her inflammation was reduced enough that the surgeon's like, wow, we've never seen anybody come in with that um, amount of non-inflammation, I guess. Um, before she went in, and then afterwards, um, it really helped with her recovery. Um, so, in looking at the fact that it might be um, FDA approved and insurance can be used, we also um, laid out our floor plan so that we would be HIPAA compliant. If if we if it went that route, we're ready. So. Did that answer your question? Sure. Okay. I'm trying to get a sense of the maximum number of clients you can serve in one one day, we'll say. So take the, you, you have the 15 minute walk that you're, you're saying for the full chamber, then you have your spot treatments. Can those happen simultaneously? How many people a day can you serve? With so a, in one chamber, correct? You have we have one chamber. chamber. We have three dressing rooms to go into that chamber. And so, um, you know, so one person is getting changed. Um, another person can be in the chamber. They come out. Next person comes in. Um, we're anticipating uh, we could probably do four to five an hour. Um, and that does not include the spot treatment? That does not include the spot treatment. That's just for the chamber. The spot treatment is going to slow us down because that can be anywhere from four to 12 minutes um, for the spot treatment. So those that do want to get um, a, a facial, needs to make sure that they're taking some extra time. So as soon as we um, have the revenue, we're getting that second spot, um, the second local machine. Okay, so there's a local machine and then there's a big chamber. Yes. Right. And then when you talk about the build out, in order to maximize that space, you have to purchase another, another unit. Another chamber. Okay, yeah. Where are you located? Great question. Uh, <laughs> Bickerson Academy. Bicker, okay, got it. There's a, they're up at, um, if you turn at, at the Chili's, at the top of the hill, there's a Vickers Plaza. Um, there used to be a pizza place up there. Oh, there used to be a Sergeant location. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We're, 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 little, yeah. we're just east of Academy on Vickers. Next to the dance studio. Yes. Yep, right next to the dance studio. Yeah. And we bought brochures and, oh, and flyers about our grand opening. So if you have more questions about the technology, what it can do for you health-wise, uh, as far as athletes or the elderly or whatever the case may be, we've got information here. Uh, but so if we're taking money, what's like your uh, like game coming out? Like, how much do you like bring in? And then, like, how, like, like are you profitable yet? yet? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> and um, and we have some some things going on as far as uh, lease issues that we're still trying to work out. So um, we don't even know um, how much our utilities is yet because we haven't started paying our utilities. Um, so we've had some other things kind of going on with that. But, um, you know, budgeted and trying to be really conservative as far as the numbers. Um, when we made out our business plan, we were looking at um, probably uh, anywhere from five to um, $20,000 profit a month um, once we get it going. When she said off the roof. No, that includes, that includes that's the drop. That includes all the expenses, those expenses. We have time for one more question before the super special question. Um, how do you come from the world of cosmeceuticals and dealing with um, distributing and, and talking about stuff that's not FDA? Um, approved 
what's your contingency plan for how do you how do you broadcast the claims of health benefits without being able to save them, right? <laughs> what's, uh, Welcome to alternative. Right, right. <laughs> alternative health. Um, so basically, we say these are what people have experienced. These are the, the benefits that people have. And that's one of the, the most amazing things about being in this business is everybody comes in and they have their own stories. Um, just like this gentleman, you know, we've had people that um, come in and they're just like, wow, I haven't slept that great in, in ages. I haven't been you know, without pain, and so those are the stories we're telling. Um, you know, we're telling my sister's story, because that's a personal story, we know it happened. You know, personally for me, I, I was going in because of low back issues and a whole knee surgery, and you know, I, I can get out of bed easily in the morning now. So, you know, it's, it's really about just sharing the stories and, and how it's affected the people that we know. Who would like to ask a super special question? Huh? What can we, as the Colorado Springs community, do for you to support you in your work? Don't get frozen. <laughs> <laughs> really, and just get the word. I mean, you know, our goal when we started this company was really to help people feel better. And so, really, just getting the word out and saying there is something that does not include ingesting anything that um, is very low risk, um, with, with the exception of a few contraindicating um, folks that, that really can't do it. Um, but we really want people to understand that it's our goal to help them feel better. So we're not doing the, oh, you come in and we'll sell you these packages and da da da. We want you to get what's comfortable for you and uh, whatever is going to help you feel better. So just 